Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Repackaging Revolution. I'm your host, David Marinette. Now, before we get to our guest, I'd like to share what we call our podcast power statement, our name of today's show, which is because packaging matters, especially with food. Today's guest is Dr. Jason Sawyer, Associate Professor of Meat Science at Auburn University. I was referred to Dr. Sawyer by a friend from Cooper Farms, Mr. Mike Whirling, who raved about Dr. Sawyer's knowledge of meat and how to protect it, but just as important, his down-to-earth approach that isn't above us non-scientists or non-meat scientists, Dr. Jason. Can't wait to learn more. Dr. Jason, welcome to the show. Thank you, sir. It's a pleasure to be here. And I look forward to having a conversation about uh, this great topic. This morning, and I know you'll appreciate this, I actually reached out to and I did a um, a little dog and pony with a plastics industry association. And it's in conjunction with packaging. And the only reason why I share that is There's not a lot of people talking about packaging. There's a lot of people, you know, yes, we have big organizations or whatever it is, but it's a topic, especially in your world with with meat um, and the fact that there's a meat science and there's a science to the packaging to protect the meat. There's a lot more to this than just a brown box. Would you agree? I'd agree 100%. Um, You know, as consumers of food products, uh, in this country and even globally, the the last thing that our food goes into is a package of some kind, right. uh, whether it's a plastic, uh, aluminum or uh, right. paper or cardboard. Uh, we're putting it into a vessel uh, that gets it to us as a consumer. Um, and, and so I think that oftentimes we've under undervalued how much packaging influences uh, our products that we as consumers purchase each and every day. Well, and it's, you know, you mentioned a couple of things there that interest me too, especially from a consumer standpoint, but especially on top of that, especially from a food preservation, food protection standpoint, you know, there's a lot more to this. And, you know, especially when it comes to food grade and barrier properties and strength or, and you've seen this more than just about anybody else, you cook and, you know, you can cook in the film now or films and packaging. There's a lot more to this that that people just don't even understand that's possible. Correct. And and technology is changing every single day. Um, and, and there's some great industries out there that are improving on the the packaging technology. Um, and you know, that that come up with new avenues in which we can uh, uh, purchase an item in a in a store, uh, right. store it in our home refrigerator uh, yep. for seven days. 14, 21, um, yep. and, and then have it know that it's safe for us to consume after that period of time. Um, yep. and, and it's just, I'm just thrilled to be able to work in the arena, uh, to understand more about what our product does when it gets into the package, uh, because it's been, been a, as a, as a research entity across the meat industry, we've just focused on how do we make product taste better? How do we make it look better? How do right. we make it appeal to consumers? But we've never really w- understood how do we make sure it's best in the package. Um, right. You know, we always think of that as the last step and we just throw it into something and throw it on a shelf. Man, you just, and, and if there's anything that I've tried to explain to people that have been in this space or new to what I do, you know, like right around this time of year, you've got people, what do you do? And whether it's new family members or something, and if there's anything that I've often said, and you just nailed it, we think of packaging at the last minute. And and I don't care whether it's meat and food packaging or whether it's industrial packaging, Doc. What happens is, is and I'm amazed, companies will spend hundreds of thousands, if not millions, on their ingredients and on their process and all their paperwork. And then they throw it together with a brown box and bubble wrap and go, no one bought it. Why is that? <laughs> And, and, you know, and then and then they're yeah. out of business. And yep. I'm like, where are you going wrong here? And you're so spot on. And yeah. it's just like, ah, oh, it drives me crazy. But just it, so true. It does. You know, ju- just in, in the R&D side of things, you know, the package oftentimes, like you said, is just the very last step of, of the process, you know, and they're just either fitting it into a current uh, packaging model or they're just throwing it into a packaging model that they know has worked in the past. And it's right. never really part of the R and D process. It's more right. all about the ingredients. Spot on with, um, you know, there might be four or five uh, developmental technologists, uh, sales and marketing, um, right. customer service reps that are all spending hours on this new product. 
And then at the end of the day, they just throw it into a box or throw it into a package, throw it on the shelf and hope that somebody's going to buy it. But they'll test it. They'll test it yeah. first in an LTO offering, right? Oh, yeah. You know, right. and be like, oh, well, why didn't people buy it? Well, probably because they didn't know about it or, you know, they didn't think that the package was attractive Important. or usable to them. Right. Um, you know, I, I was at the store yesterday and, uh, and packaging, like I said, it's changing every every day. Um, I, I saw at the grocery store on at, at the register, a uh, bubble gum or a gum manufacturer yeah, yeah. had switched their packaging to a cardboard package. Oh, that, wow. And we're promoting it as a recyclable material. Uh, man, we, you and I, we could just, uh, okay, there's so many. Pla- now, I just did, you, here's one, and, and I know you'll appreciate this along those same lines. I just did a uh, quick rebuttal to Delta Airlines came out with uh, a couple weeks ago that they're eliminating all plastic cups on uh, their, at their, their planes. And I get the PR push on that, but my problem with this, and I don't care from a packaging guy, Doc, I'll sell you whatever you want. You want paper, you want plastic, whatever, but don't tell me that there's no ramifications for you switching over from all plastic to cups because nobody is looking at the how much energy and paper and trees and water and natural resources and energy to create paper cups. And paper cups have to have a lining because a pure paper cup without lining isn't going to hold any liquid. That lining often makes that cup very hard to recycle or break down. This is a catch-22, and it's just like, guys, no. (laughs) And uh, my point with this is just like you're saying at the cash register, Marketing is trumping um, reality here. Marketing is saying, hey, we could pick up some people, Delta, and we can tell everybody, look how great we are. But wait a minute. Wait, you have to look at the other side. And and if there's anything that I try to teach people, whether it's through this podcast, whether it's through from alliances, whether it's in the industry, is you have to look at the entire life cycle. You have to look at the entire chain of events, not just the product, but the energy, the material, the uh, gathering of waste, the picking it up. Can you dispose of it? Can you grind it back up? What does it make? You know, and all that stuff. And I know here in our country, that's like foreign language, Doc. They don't even think like this. Nope. And and it's like, man, you've got to look at the big picture. Got to. Yeah. 100%. You know, in the beef or in the meat industry, um, you know, most of our like uh, processors are in the Midwest, you know, Cleveland and Ohio, oh, yeah. Illinois, sure. uh, Texas and things like that. And then we'll process those animals, put their parts and pieces into a plastic bag of some kind, put that bag in a box or in a combo and then ship it to another part of the country. And then we take that out of the bag and then put it back into some other value added processing and put it yeah. into another bag of some right. kind and another box. That's right. not oftentimes full and, right. and because of how we package it. And like you said, I don't believe that as an industry, we look at the big picture on why are we putting it in the bag in the first step when right. it doesn't need a bag. It just right. needs to be shipped somewhere Correct. without plastic and just yep. in a big uh, pl- uh, a recyclable tote that can be washed upon Correct. Uh, and reused. Um, yep. And we don't think about that process. We're concerned about well, the color is going to be impacted or that we can't store it long enough or, you know, and, and, and there, to me, there's ways in which we can navigate those issues in our industry yep. Yep. and cut that usage by a- instrument, uh, astronomical amount. hundred percent. And, and, you know, it's also interesting too. And, and that's a great point because a lot of times I try to explain, and I know you'll get this. We are very lazy in this country. We are very set in our ways. That's the way it's always been done. And why would we look at a re- recyclable tote when we can just keep throwing more plastic at it or more paper? And I'm in that world, but I, like you, want to do what's right for the environment as well. And if we just thought this out a little bit further and just went, now, wait a minute, what if we, you know, reuse these totes and color coded them and send this, you know, this place because it's a return cycle or whatever. And, but we are so resistant to change. We are so lazy. It's a very broad statement, but I've seen it 
And oftentimes, some of the biggest companies, I don't care who it is, they're just sort of like, well, don't rock the boat. Let's keep doing what we've always done. We're making money. And I'm like, guys, you can't, one side of that same company, you pick any um, Fortune 500 company, you got one side that says a sustainable do right for the environment. Then you got another guy over on the finance side going like, don't rock that boat, man. We're making 20%. We're not yep. even monkeying with that. Yeah. And we're not going to lead the way in case somebody, and that's, it's skewed. It's messed up and something's got to change. Totally. 100% agree. 100% agree. There's a lot of uh, companies today that, they're starting to have that conversation about packaging and how they can make it uh, a more recycled system. But those are the conversations they should have had 15 years ago because yeah. they haven't changed their processes anyway. And just now they're asking, well, can we not make this more recyclable? I mean, right. you know, if they had asked that question 10 years ago, they would have reduced the total volume of plastics or, or paper that they've used yep. over the lifetime in the last 10 years in that company and probably saved them not millions, but billions. It, you got it. You got it. And and it's changing every day. And I like you. Okay, so we we all agree. Okay, it's messed up. So let's try to fix it. But on the on the same token, it's it's one of those things that we've got to get to those decision makers, and we've got to get to those people that go, okay, but for the good of the environment, or the good of the industry, or the good of whatever. We've got to start, and, and that's where these alliances start to come together. And that's why I was so excited to talk with you, because part of these connections with you and me and the world and the environment and the certain industries, that's how things are going to change. When you get people beyond, well, that's a competitor of mine, and this guy, I don't like him because he goes to Auburn, and this other one is from Georgia. The point is, is that as an industry and as a um, uh, consumers, um, and as manufacturers, we have got to kind of get beyond the, you know, the bot total bottom dollar and look at a way for us to rethink how things are packaged and, and, and do something for, for Pete's sakes, for the good of the industry and good of the environment than it is just, you know, each, each of us, you know yep. what I mean? hundred percent agree. You know, I had a colleague, uh, from, uh, that they found they did a study, uh, they published it last year, but they probably did the study about a year, two years ago and they reported and recorded the amount of meat wastage, um, that came out of grocery stores, uh, based upon that was just sitting and never sold. And then, or that was discarded because of its use by date and in those stores. And that's not even all the stores in the country. I mean, this right. was only 5,000 stores across all the food stores in our United States that sells food. And what they found was that, you know, there's a considerable amount of product that just gets thrown away that consumers never buy. I know. And it's in a packaging platform that goes straight yep. to the landfill. Yep. And if not a platform that can be reused, recycled, it's never going to go away. It's going to be in there forever. And, and so to me, we haven't, that should be enough to say, hey, we're wasting, let's just put a number, say 5%. We're throwing it away. 5% in all of our grocery stores gets thrown away and nobody ever eats it. To right. me, that's a number that's large enough to say we need to package it in a platform that makes it last longer. Yes. And that late makes it so that even if we don't get it sold and we still have two weeks of life left on it, we can donate it to another entity that can Thank use you. it um, you. In, in that process. And we don't yep. do enough of it because these companies are very concerned about the legality side of donating and the foodborne illness issue. And I get that. I but, get that too. But we have to put it in a packaging platform and control it from a temperature standpoint that allows us for more end use of that product other than here it sits in your store shelf. Nobody bought it. So let's just pick it up, throw it away and fill up the landfills even more in that process. Yeah. And, you know, there, there's two, there, man, we could, we could talk forever. You know, you've got the landfill issue, which is so spot on because a lot of times in, in the, the one thing a lot of people don't understand is once something gets to the landfill, the first thing they do, because trash, I don't care what it is, smells. So the first thing they do is bury it. 
So that negates. And again, once you do that, whether it's plastic or paper or newspaper or, or whatever, it's no longer exposed to air and sunlight, so nothing can break down. Well, that kills the smell, but it doesn't help with the, you know, so you've got that part in reducing what goes in landfill. The other thing that I, and I can't wait to noodle this with you, is we have a real waste collection issue here in, in the country, meaning where you're at compared to where I'm at in Cleveland, I guarantee you those are two different rules and regulations when it comes to how, what's, what you can recycle, what you can pick up, what you can dispose of. You go to the next town over, completely different rules and regulations. You go, and that to me is just crazy. We have no, and, and by the way, there is no incentive then for mm-hmm. people to kind of follow the rules. Everybody's just, and, and the, the final thing that just totally blows my mind is somewhere along the line, our children or people in general think that littering is okay. Yeah. Just, just throw it away. Just yeah. throw it away, like on the side of the road. Yeah. Just throw it away. That's learned behavior. That is learned behavior. Somebody said that was okay. And so the system is so big and so large that if we don't get some sort of a way to pull this together, and just like you said, take a number, 5%, start somewhere, do something that you can start moving this Titanic in a different direction, that's when this is going to, I mean, so many times we all want the quick fix. There is no quick fix here. Yeah. Everybody wants to throw money at this and think it's going to go away. That's not going to happen. We've got to change the way we think. And that that's a tough one, man. It's yep. really hard. It really is. You know, just changing the consumer's mindset on how they do anything is, is monumental. Like you said, it is like a big steamship in the ocean. You know, it takes yep. forever to turn. Just like you say, in our part of the country, we might have one regional location that can recycle and pick those things up. But then we have a town maybe that only has a thousand people in it and they, there, there is no option for them. And so right. they're either left throwing it into a regular trash or burning it uh, into the environment or yep. throwing it out on to the road or into the backyard. And it, you know, creates more of a problem in that manner. It, it's kind of like teaching people how to cook. Um, yeah. most, most college kids don't know how to cook anything. Exactly. You know, they, they, buy, they eat most of their meals away from their home. Uh, because in their minds, it's financially cheaper for them to grab a sub sandwich somewhere. Yep. And so they don't see the benefit. But if you taught them the benefit of that dollar and that it's a far cheaper investment to cook your own meal versus purchase Chipotle. It, yeah, yeah, Chipotle. <laughs> then, you know, it, then you start that educational process. But we don't teach that in our K through 12 system anymore. I know. And I don't think that we teach this this concept well enough in our curriculum uh, in the lower school system to understand how products are generated and manufactured and how we're recycling. I mean, my, my, my kids are young and they talk a little bit about recycling and, re, you know, and, and limited, but a lot of that is what my wife and I drive, yeah, uh, yeah, in, you know, exactly. in that process. Um, and my wife's a bigger hippie than I am. Uh, in, in the recycling and the reduction yep. uh, of yep. waste for those things. And so I think we definitely have to do a better job of education and, uh, and improving our, our foundational uh, yep. group of people that understand how that works. I, I work with students all the time. Uh, and in my classes, uh, we talk about a lot of packaging, of course. And, and I really tell them like, and I try to put it in their mindset to be like, you know, these movies like uh, Wally uh, that yep. Disney created, yep. you know, yep. we left the earth uh, in the movie because it was full of trash. And I said, yep. you know, if we don't find a better way to manage how we consume products and store products and, and utilize dispose those of products, products, dispose yep. of products, then we're going to be set in that same situation. Maybe not in 10 years, maybe not in 15, but maybe in 50 or maybe it's, it's definitely 25. coming. Well, it's eventually going to, you know, and I really am optimistic for our young people. I really think, and we were talking about this the other day, and it was just a couple of friends chatting. And and as much as the young people are criticized that they live on their phone and they have no feelings or whatever it is, you can say what you want. But the one thing I'm so encouraged with is they can think for themselves and they do think for themselves. And I don't know of a young person from our kids on down that aren't willing to go, no, that doesn't feel right. Not doing it. 
And that to me is so encouraging if we can, instead of, you know, us old guys, me, um, out there trying to kind of stir the pot and make things happen, we've got to get the young people to lead the charge. They're their future anyhow. And if we can't allow them to kind of, okay, then young folks, what is the best way for us to get the message across? Because they're the ones that are consuming, whether this information's on their phone or online or whatever, how do we meet them where they're at? How do we stop the, the way it's always been? And if there's anything I'm so excited about is I think the young people have the opportunity to truly change the world now. They, they need to be encouraged. They need to, we need to encourage whether it is, um, politically or, or with money or whatever it is to allow them to make change. And that too is a whole nother story. But the young people have got to be able to, you know, to understand that they, they, they really do have the ability to change things. Really yep. do. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. I think, uh, you know, they, they just haven't never had that opportunity to to shine in that moment and they haven't had somebody to say hey it's okay to stand up and do that and you know they've just been kind of food spoon fed for so long and yeah they they know how to make good decisions sometimes they rely too much on do i make this decision or do i not make this decision but what mom and dad says first you know like well and and they're afraid to make that jump into it but i think they're ready to do it um, Without a doubt. And the other thing I want to encourage too, and, and I know you and I agree on this, is so many of, I can speak for myself, came up through the environment of don't make mistakes, don't make mistakes. Or if you do make a mistake, it's going to be held against you forever. Yeah. That's just so s- screwed thinking. Our children and our kids and our young people have to learn that it's okay to fail. That's how we learn. You're in. You're a professor in academia. You understand that's how we learn, and and so many of these young people, like you were describing, they want to make a decision. They want to, but what if I screw this up? Or what if it? You know what? It's okay. And you know, it can. Let's control the back backside of this. If what's the worst that can happen, and what can we do to make sure that even if the worst happens, we've got it covered. They've got, you know, as a society, we are so, you know, first of all, we applaud the risk takers, the Steve Jobs and all those guys that are the risk takers. But then we vilify the people that actually make a mistake and go like, I got to start over again. Oh, you're such a fool. No, you've got to be able to. And that's where if we can encourage that, encourage, go ahead and fail, try and fail. I'd rather you do that than sit around watching you know, uh, the, the, the world pass you by. It's yep. incredible. hundred percent. I, you know, I train a, a lot of, uh, students, uh, as graduate students in, in our program here. And a lot of times, you know, they'll, they'll be knocking on my door. They'll be sitting in my office and they'll be like, well, how should I do this? Or how should I do that? And I'm like, figure this out first. Thank <laughs> you. Come, come to Thank me you. with a, this is what I'd like to do. And then we'll have a conversation of, is this the best plan or not best plan? Yeah. And a lot of yeah. times I'm not standing beside them when they're doing a lot of these projects because I would rather them fail in, in doing a project than, and we have to redo it yeah. than for me to control so many of the variables because I know what's going to happen or what I, yeah. what I think is going to happen. And I can kind of see that, you know, into the future of, yeah. okay, here's what we need to plan that I can see you're not planning it. So I'm going to, I, I, I can control that, but I don't need to control that because no. they need to either be successful or they need to have those mistakes where they're like, oh, I should have done this or I should yep. have done that. And yep. so I use a lot of that uh, philosophy in how I train students. Uh, it differs from a lot of people um, in, in that process. But I think that at the end of the day, it helps in guiding some of these young adults into how they can become better decision makers in, when they leave here and, and start their careers. And I've got a, a, a student that I brought with me when I first started here, and uh, he's now running a startup meat business in Arizona. Wow. And, um, you know, I didn't teach him any of that stuff, but yeah. he just had the ability and the willingness to just go through the decision making process. I gave him yep. some skills and some knowledge about packaging and meat. And he's really just applied it to everything that he's done and starting this up. He's not the invest. It's not his business. He's running yep. it for another investor, but yep. it's still like 
I didn't teach him any of those things. Um, right. and, 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 but it goes to show that the method in which I, we did train him, got him Correct. prepared for that process. Well, and that, that is also a testament. I know you're, you're too, you won't say it, but I mean, <laughs> you gave him that, that kind of platform to be able to kind of go out there and take what you gave him that support, whether it was direct or indirect, but to have the support to say, yeah, I can do this. Yeah, I can do this. And let's face it, 10 years, 20 years, he probably will own that company yeah. or a company like it. Because if we teach our kids, okay, face your fears and do it anyway, versus face your fears and run the opposite direction, that's not going to help anything. Face them, face them, make mistakes, make changes and tweak. My goodness, man, um, that's the way we're going to make change all the way across the board. Totally. Yep. 100%. Yeah. So how does a guy like you, let's go back, because we went off on a couple different riffs. <laughs> yeah. So you grew up in the Midwest. Tell me a little bit more, a little bit of that. And I know you started out kind of as a, uh, as a, a technologist, if you will, at Tyson. So let's take us, take us back a little bit. Yeah, so I grew up in the Midwest. Kansas is where I was born and raised. Um, yep. and was Q, by the way, Doc, was Q39 still there? Q39. Q39, barbecue place. That's no, right. There's there's no. a couple famous ones, but there's okay. Joe's and that kind of stuff. Yeah, just just Joe's and Jack yeah, yeah. Sass. Yeah, right. oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. I, I, we grew up in a small town in the central part of the state. So going to Got Kansas it. City was like going to a whole nother world for us. Um, you know, I and, digress. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> and so I was like 19 the first time I ever got out of the airplane. Um, wow. Yeah. Wow. Like, and, and so and growing up in Kansas, you either go to the University of Kansas and Lawrence yep. or you go to Kansas State University in Manhattan. Yep. And uh, I chose to go to Manhattan and study for you. animal science. And it was a great time. And then I, 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 it was in that time when you went to college where, you know, the internet was first developing. So you went to go to impress all those people on campus, like, because mm -hmm. that was your gateway. They were the gatekeeper to getting a job, starting That's a career. Correct. And, right. and if you didn't impress them out of all the other people on campus, you you looked at yourself and you're like, oh, I might be working at McDonald's after this is over. And so, you know, it just evolved and went to graduate school um, in, in Stillwater, Oklahoma, and Oklahoma State. Oh, yeah. Uh, and, and then moved on from there to the University of Arkansas uh, for my PhD. And, and so, but I met people when I was in, in those programs and I really just got hired at Tyson by uh, a colleague that I met. Nice. Um, and he was another graduate student. He started work at Tyson a year and a half before I did. Um, and he, and he's like, man, you just need to come work for us. And I was like really hesitant about it, but I'm so grateful that I did because I learned a lot about the industry that I knew nothing about going Correct. to call. And I tell students all the time, uh, every single day you're, you're going to sit in classes and these people are going to tell you a lot of things, but most of them have never worked in the industry whatsoever. <laughs> And, and you've got to go do an internship right. for 10 weeks. You've yeah. got to go work a year in the industry because it is, it, there is no class that can prepare you for working in that industry. And there was not, and, and I thought the same thing. I was like, I went to school for 11 years and I'm like, well, I, I know nothing. And, yeah. you know, it was, it was the hardest job I had ever had probably, no kidding. Um, yeah. you know, because there's so much information. It was, it's, it was sensory overload yeah. um, for me. Uh, but as a food technologist, uh, it was an opportunity to learn about what the made the industry work. And working yeah. for Tyson Foods, one of the largest, you know, food manufacturers in the in the world, um, you got to see that it wasn't just about that. Hey, we produced one good pound of hot dogs. Right. We produced a right. hundred million pounds yeah. of really good yeah. hot dogs, or yeah. that we sold and produced ten million pounds of uh, deli. Uh, yep. chicken products to yep. Walmart every single yep. week. And then yep. when you start to see those numbers, you're like, holy cow, like I that's, know. that's huge. Like, and you know, and it was, it was all, it was the best of times there. And it was also the worst because I started right when the economic, you know, that downturn of 08 yep. and 09. And, yep. and so you're like the last person hired thinking you're the first person fired. Um, yep. There were people, there were whole floors of people uh, that were terminated on, on certain mm. Fridays and Wednesdays. And you were just like, gosh, I hope it's not my day. But you learned a lot about that time where you're like, hey, if we can find the solutions to package things differently, to make it last longer, to yep. add ingredients, to make it last longer, to be safer, 
Uh, yeah. We could produce more per, you know, per animal unit. Um, yeah. That was a great learning experience during that time. Um, and, and I don't think you could ever, you know, just like you said, whether it's Tyson or, or anybody, but yeah. when, when through attrition and you're there at that level and, and, and fortunately you were, you didn't have that, you know, that particular bad Friday. But the point is, is that, you know, man, I can only imagine you at that point as being a sponge, because I bet you, you were doing a bunch of different things that you probably never thought in a million years should be doing, especially with Tyson. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, they, they, you know, I was working on chicken projects, hot dog projects, pet food projects. Yeah. Um. You know, we were working. We would have meetings with marketing team, sales yep. guy, people. Yeah. Um. You know, and things that you had to discuss. And I'm just like, you know, I'm trying to tell you the science, but the science doesn't matter anymore. It's about what. How can I help the customer get to their yep. product and make it a better product? You know, you were operating machinery. Uh, because you were shorthanded with people. I was taking out boxes to the trash bin uh, because we had, we didn't have as many people there right. uh, at that time. And you just did the job. I mean, that's, yeah, right. that's you know, if, I've always kind of had that, like um, had some folks tell me like, you got to kind of know how to do every person's job to understand how, how they do their job from right. the janitor right. to the CEO, yep. you know, yep. and I was never a CEO, but it was one in which I never wanted that responsibility because that was a heavy burden, um, Big time. you know, to deal with that kind of, you know, how much you're losing or how much you're gaining, continue to see the growth of, of, of the company. And the amount of pressure they're under to, you know, and we see it every day. One on, on one uh, announcement, uh, a company uh, reports um, uh, record earnings. Yep. And a day later, the same company just lays off 100 people because they need to make sure that those earnings continue for the next quarter. Yep. And it's so like pressure is, I, I don't know if I'd take that either. Yeah, crazy. it was crazy. So, but it was a lot. I learned a lot during that time and it really shaped the, you know, uh, it shapes everything that I do in, in yep. my, in my current role. And, yep. and, and so at one point, you know, I just got to the point where I was like, you know, I really want to get back into the academic arena. And so I took a, I took a chance and took a job at a small school in Texas um, and, and kind of started on the academic arena. Um, and then, uh, this, an opportunity came available here at Auburn. And, and so I just jumped at, at that chance and was very grateful and fortunate yeah. that they hired me here a, 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 into this role. And so, uh, it's one in which, you know, I try to capture, um, and, 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 uh, and utilize every ounce of what I learned in the industry side right. to, to shift what we do on the research side of things. Yeah. And if there's anything that I want to continue and I can't wait for us to continue this friendship because I, I, guys like you have knowledge and information that is invaluable c to guys like me from the packaging space, from the, from the other side of the equation. And it's, it's one of those things that fascinates me because it's people that can make suggestions from your year end saying, Hey, you know, just like you mentioned about making the, the meat last longer for two extra weeks so that it, yes, it may not sell at retail, but it could be donated to a food bank and all those kind of things that a lot of times people don't think that way. And a lot of times people don't think all the way through. They've looked at their bottom dollar. They understand that that's what they need to make. But it's, it's, this is how industries are built or side side industries are built based upon suggestions you know from guys like you that are in that mix so with that being said the one thing that i'm i i know is a common bond because we've talked about packaging you know just and this is just not to put you on the spot but for us to keep talking down the road is how do we from the packaging standpoint if there's any low-lying fruit out there in the meat space where do we focus? What is, is it recyclability? Is it the environmental piece? Is it cost savings? Is it, is there anything out there that, you know, that, that really just sort of like, man, this is, this is such a no brainer. Um, I don't know if that made any sense, but yeah, it, the, man, you get me excited. Um, and, and to, to, there are some very low lying fruits. The people selling the product on their store shelves won't take on. And they, it's because they're afraid to change and their consumer base is so powerful that they think they drives everything through their store. Right. 
I believe that if you change and don't give consumers an option, they'll still buy it. They're not going to find another store. So let's stay there for this because this is where you and I are like like long lost brothers here. I don't have the beard though, but you and I are <laughs> long lost brothers. That is that is something that is so true because what what and that's where I think it's it we tend to try to make everybody happy. We're trying to make sure that the retailer's happy, the consumer's happy, the person that consumes the product is happy all the way down through the line. I get that logic, but we've gotten so big and it's gotten so, we have to actually, you know, it's that if you give somebody 12 choices, they're not going to make any choice. It's either A or B. You want A or B. You want this or that. And and you're exactly right. If if we're going to make change, focus on something for the good of the industry, focus on something for the good of the environment, it's A or B. Because otherwise, if you give them C and D and E, they're just going to go tilt. They're just going to, eh, you know what, keep it the same. Because I look at, and I know you can relate to this, and this is where it's it's just like, why aren't other people doing this? It wasn't that long ago that Method Soap kind of came on board with their 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 liquid soap in a bag. And everybody was like, this is the greatest thing since sliced bread. It's unbelievable. Look at this. And frankly, what they th- their product was not necessarily any better than dial soap or whatever it was, but they packaged it in a flexible bag. And the thing I'm amazed, you know, and I it, it, they ended up selling that brand, Method Soap, to Unilever for 40% more than a, a competing brand because they had a niche they were the company that's in the flexible pouch and they were the company. And that's where, just like you're saying, packaging can actually grow a company's business. Packaging can actually lead to more sales. We say it here all the time. Packaging is the voice of your brand. It's, it really does say who, what you stand for, what you're about. If you're just mailing it in, it stands for that. And it basically shows, yeah, just a brown box. I'm going to throw it in there like anybody else. Or your Amy Lou sausages in Costco that actually is dialing that in and minimizing what they're using to to case pack what they've got, and that that's a game changer. And you know, and and it's just like, man, it's so it's so disjointed. Crazy. It is, it is. You know, and I think the biggest low lying fruit is if we would switch all of our case ready meats. To vacuum packaging today. Yep. If we would remove them from their styrofoam PVC kind of application um, and put them into vacuum packaging, we could put more in a box and yep. put more boxes on a pallet and more pallets in a truck uh, yep. that are loaded. And so we can make less trips to the store or fr- yep. from the manufacturer to the distribution, distribution or to the to, landfill or to the landfill. Yeah. yeah. And and to me, that's the quickest change that our industry can jump into is to remove uh, PVC and, and, and the polyvinyl chloride films uh, and the styrofoam trays all together uh, from, from our meat packaging and put everything into a vacuum package of some kind. So let's let's stay with that. It, it's you're talking about because I just was at the grocery the other day, and you've got this, the the polystyrene black tray. Then you got a piece of salmon on there, and then a shrink pack. You're talking about basically take that styrene out of there and just shrink that into the into the vacuum film. Is that, yep. is that right? That's what I'm talking about. Yeah. Same same thing with like I beef, agree. pork. You I know, agree. you can buy bricks at Costco right now. You know, three bricks for whatever, $21, you know, saddle pack is what we call yep. those. Yeah. But you can buy individual bricks at some grocery stores as well, Publix or, you know, yep. uh, I, I, do you get, what's your store up there, Wegmans? Um, well, Wegmans, you've got Heinen's, yep. we've got Giant Eagle and some okay. of these others. Yeah. So some of them may offer a little bit more vacuum package in their case-ready fresh meats like beef and yep. pork. But yep. in, in some parts of the country where it's just maybe a Walmart or a Kroger, a lot of it's still overwrapped with the styrofoam yep. tray. Um, you know, and there's a little bit, uh, of vacuum packaging, but vacuum packaging is increasing. It, it has jumped in the I last four years to like almost 58% of the footprint of the, of the retail case. I think it needs to be almost 85% Correct. Uh, of that because it puts more product in the case. Yep. It gives the consumer potentially the opportunity to recycle more yep. of their pra- packaging yep. uh, because yep. a lot of these manufacturers of plastics 
um, are are pushing more of these recyclable ready yep. materials. To me, that's our quickest change is right there. I love that. And I, I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to run with that in some way, shape or form, because I think that's 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 not only profound, but it's it's so simple that it, it's it's like because I have seen that and and I totally Look, consumers want to make sure that the food is okay and safe to use, whether that's safe to store, uh, freeze it or whatever. Okay, got it. So vacuum pack, take the air out. It stays fresher for longer. A lot of that material, I don't care whether it's monolayer film or if it's actually um, a different type of laminated, it's still recyclable. Not the same exact, but it's recyclable, which is... uh, Another thing to add to what you were saying, create this back end of this so that we could recycle that material. I mean, and it, by the way, there's films out there now that are curbside recyclable. You don't have to return that to the butcher or to the store. You can curbside recycle and it can be made again and again and again. And you're right. That's why I'm glad I asked you because you really nailed it for me. Um, there's such low lying fruit and there's so much opportunity and it we don't ha- this doesn't have to be a cure for cancer doc no we don't have to start there yeah. we have to go with something that's right in front of us saying like why aren't we doing this this is crazy it, you know so many of these retail outlets are are so afraid that their consumer has been trained on yep. color as an indicator yep to me we shipped that story and say Convenience yep. is your friend and yep. it becomes more user friendly. It can be stored longer. It can be safer. Yep. And, and most consumers, they don't care. You know, they're not caring what color is in a hot dog. And that thing can last 90 days sitting in that retail case. Yep. And yep. The, most consumers don't know that. Uh, but yep. because of the packaging and how we store it, it can sit there for 90 days. Our fresh beef and pork, it can only sit there about five to seven days at max and they were pulling it out of the way. If we ship that packaging platform, we reduce the amount that we throw away. Uh, Consumers have a more user-friendly product. You just can't give them an option of having both platforms in the case at the same time because they're always still going to choose the alternative in their minds. It's hard for me to land this plane, my friend, because we could, I could keep flying here forever. But if I am going to land this plane a little bit, let me ask you this. So a guy like me that, that truly wants to bring community together, create a community of goodwill, bring people together to keep having these conversations about this from the packaging side, how does somebody like me in this world, just like you shared, the low-lying fruit, maybe even if it's vacuum packaging or whatever, is that from the retail level or do we go all the way back to the to the Tysons of the world, to the meat packing guys? It's almost like we need the buy-in from the higher, the bigger players to say, we're going to do something different. And here's why. I, I mean, I, hear me out for a second. I think one of the biggest problems that a lot of times people don't explain what they're doing. If, if John Q. Public understood a, a color coding system or here's why we, we, you know, put a QR code on a, on a thing so they could scan it. And the reason why we changed to this packaging and John Q. Consumer with their phone will go, Oh, that's why I like that. Yeah. Nobody explains why they do things. Everything is always like, well, I hope they figure that out. But if we can really yeah. tell people, and this is why we're doing this. And look at how much we can, you know, save, or look at how much we can donate, or look at how much. And 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 really, if you were looking into your crystal ball, how do where do we start with that? Is that a retail level? Is that the is that the Tyson's of the world? Is that the Cooper Farms? What what is that? Or or I don't know. I, I think uh, in crystal ball wise, we've got to get to the retailers uh, because yeah. they're the drivers that tell the manufacturers, the Tyson, the JBS, the Cargill, this is what we want to put on our shelf. You guys manufacture it to this specification. And so the people that we need to have this conversation with is the the Kroger, the Walmart, the Publix, the Wegmans. Those are the people that are the ones that are renting out that store shelf space and, and saying, this is what we'll allow on that shelf. Those are the people that we need to say, folks, we can make a change 
and your consumers will still buy it if yep. you make this change. And yep. it will be better for everybody yep. because yep. it will reduce the, their throwaways. It would reduce the, it, it would increase the amount of product that they can get manufactured and shipped to their distribution warehouses. And their consumers at the end of the day are still going to be happy with the product um, well, that they're buying. And, and they're probably going to make more money selling more. Um, and it's not that hard, especially when you think about some of the changes that you even suggested, Doc aren't costly. They're probably a cost savings for, if, if anything. And the other part, so there was a reason why I asked you that. If you would promise me, whether that's next year, two years from now, whatever, when we have an opportunity to introduce me to a Wegmans or a, um, a Costco or somebody that actually, whether it's at a, you know, one of our joint um, uh, trade shows or something, that's how, it, it, and it, it could be a pet project. It could be a trial project. It could be something that we can share in a region and say, this region did this in the Southeast and they did, and this was, because that's how we're going to be able to kind of carry this forward throughout the nation. You know, again, we're so quick on the quick fix. Everybody wants to click their fingers and throw money at it and think it's going to go away. But if, but if we truly want to make change and get people together that say, yeah, I'll fund that project. In fact, I'll run the film for nothing. Yeah. In fact, I'll go down this road if you and I could work together and we could, you know what I mean? And that's how, because a lot of times these retailers or even the, 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 the manufacturers themselves are like, oh man, that's going to cost a lot of money and I don't know what we're going to do. I'll do it myself. I'll do it myself. And we'll, and, and. It's just like, so anyhow, I, I put you on the spot. I didn't want to do that, but I just, you know, just as a friend, if you yep. would just be thinking about there's, there's some knucklehead in Cleveland, Ohio, that's crazy enough to start using these connections here to bring people together to at least yeah. try, at least try. No, you know, I absolutely, I, I think it's great. You know, this is a great platform. Um, and I think that these are the people um, that, uh, need to be out there sharing that story. My guess is that uh, they would have their prep done about, well, we're doing this from a recyclable standpoint, this sustainability. And, and how's and, that working out for you, yeah, Mr. Wegman? Exactly. How's that working out for you? Yeah. yeah right. You know, and, and so I, I think that those are the types of people that, you know, I, on this kind of platform would, yeah. would be advantageous, um, yeah. you know, to, to have, and to have a, a discussion about how yeah. they're, improving on that opportunity because i think a lot of them just look at it as like well if we can reduce the number of trucks running across the country and you know cuts it curbs our carbon emissions yep. you know if we can recycle our own water and treat it yep. in that manner that we're doing this all of those things stack up right but we also look at what are we also wasting in a given day too and Correct. many of them were wasting not only uh, uh, other things like water, but they're wasting plastic and they're wasting yeah. car and paper. Uh, whether it's uh, exactly. you know boxes coming in that are full yeah. and they're smashing down, and then hopefully trying to recycle those, um, or they're way bringing you the product in plastic material, ripping yeah. it out of, yeah. recutting it, portioning it, and putting it into another thing of plastic uh, right. at times. And so yeah. uh, it, it's just an area that I think that we've got to do more work in. Um, and, and we got to be uh, more aware of so we yeah. can, you know, be well, it's, a better model. It's having those conversations. I used to go to a trade show called the Food Evolution Summit, and that was out in usually San Diego or maybe Arizona. He always picked like a, a warm location <laughs> or the where. That's <laughs> fine. Great. And there was always some pretty big players, whether that be from, you know, Green Giant or Tyson's or Hormel. And, you know, it, it's almost like, you know, we're, we're in agreement. We, we almost need that guy, that person, that VP, that, that um, you know, maybe it's a COO level that says, yeah, let's, yeah, we got to do something. We got to start because it's a PR move, number one, that they're saying they're doing something proactively because everybody's talking this great, you know, at, at every 10 minutes I'm seeing the Honda commercial for their, you know, fuel cells and stuff. Awesome. Awesome. Great. But there's so much right here. We're talking 20 years and okay, that, but let's focus right here. And, um, it really needs that senior, um, buy-in and, you know, and that's where, it, that's where the dialogue like this is so valuable. And I, I can't thank you enough for, for a, taking the time to come on here 
I can't wait to come down and, and, and we'll go out and have dinner together. And I just, you know, there's, this is the start of something, Doc. And I really am grateful and, and honored that you would take the time to do this with us. And especially on a short holiday week. And man, I, I was just absolutely thrilled. This is a thrill for me. Well, it's a it's a privilege to be invited, and I appreciate the time that uh, you took to visit with me about this uh, kind of topic. Uh, you know, there there's not a lot of glory in it sometimes, uh, no, but uh, exactly <laughs> right. It's unglamorous. I told yeah. my wife when we yeah. got married, I'm in a very unglamorous business. There's nothing sexy about this. No, no. <laughs> so, but I appreciate yeah. it. It's awesome, yeah, uh, and. and uh, and, you know, anytime that uh, you want to have a conversation about it, uh, we'd love to, to, to talk more about it. Um, and we look forward to you coming and visiting, um, Absolutely. you know, and uh, and seeing more about what we do uh, yes, here sir. with the packaging side of things, you know, that's really just spurred off of relationships of the industry. Yep. So, um, and, and we've learned so much about packaging from anything from meat products to uh, coffee creamers to meat sticks and cheese and, and yep. string cheese. Um, yep. and, 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 you know, the, the, and the plastics that go into those and, and the, and, and how we can make those a, a better product, uh, you know, for use in, in our, uh, in, in our processing of, of food products. And so right. it, it's yeah. been a great experience and, you know, um, and, and the pet food side of things was, uh, just kind of the introduction to that arena and sharing that knowledge with those people just to get them thinking on the forefront when yeah. you make a new pet food. Yep. That dog or cat doesn't pick out that product off the store That's shelf. Correct. It, That's it, right. It's the consumer like yeah, you and exactly. I that yep. has to understand what's going into that package. That's uh, correct. And, and why it makes it a better product for them. Yep. And, yep. and so I think that's why we've always kind of been involved with those group down here uh, on the pet food side of things. Yeah. And the pet food's an interesting thing. We'll wrap this up because Mike and I knew each other, Mike from Cooper Farms, because they've yep. got, you know, and and what's interesting from the pet side of things, he and I were, were traveling together at the um, Super Zoo out in Vegas. I yep. think it was in the middle of the summer. And um, there's a lot of time, we spent a lot of time with Blue Buffalo and Big Heart Brands and whatever. And they're just, they're so ripe. That industry is so ripe to do something, but they're so afraid of Fido getting sick. They're fr so afraid. And I get that. We're dog lovers and animal lovers too, but there's such an opportunity there to be able to package that food in different ways and use different substrates that are actually going to keep it fresher for longer, protect it, and actually keep the dogs healthier. And uh, I mean, it's a natural tie-in, Doc, that, that just man it's a talk about another big big business you know huge. crazy unbelievable huge. that industry has grown like doubled in the last like three years from yeah, 80 and, and, million to like 168 million well let's face it i mean it's if if they're anything like my wife she'll go hungry before she takes our dog off of his high protein diet yeah. there's just no way yeah and and people you know fido gets the Fido doesn't get table scraps. Fido <laughs> gets that he's eating off of China over here. You can't. Yeah. This yeah. is crazy. Yep. Unbelievable. I, it is. Well, it Doc, is. this was this is a thrill. I Merry Christmas to you and your family. Um, Thank you. Happy holidays. I will circle back with you. 